without further ado, to introduce our guest speaker tonight. So Christopher Clancy is a recent immigrant to New Zealand, having moved here in June, uh, June 2019 from Houston, Texas. Prior to leaving the United States, Christopher was a secondary teacher for 12 years in Houston public schools, teaching European history, psychology, and world history. Upon moving to New Zealand, Christopher joined the Holocaust Centre of New Zealand as Education Director in November 2019. Christopher is working to ensure that all New Zealand students are taught the important lessons of the Holocaust, the relevancy of not ignoring hate, and being the voice for those who are voiceless. So a huge welcome, welcome to Chris tonight, and uh, you know, I look forward to the presentation itself. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koto, kia koto, kua tai mai me ki te tautoko, te kopapa o tenewa. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. The Diary of Anne Frank has been a source of inspiration for countless generations since the world first learned of her and her years in hiding. If there's not one thing wrong, there's always something else. <laughs> From plays and movies to a new incarnation on YouTube, students and adults alike have looked to this young woman as a light in the dark, a guide to what the world could be instead of what the world actually is. Yet for many, her true story is unknown. The story of her as a refugee and the story of how she became a refugee. And tonight, we're gonna to be looking at not just her story, but those refugees that were lucky enough to make it to New Zealand and how that's relevant to New Zealand. So our presentation tonight, we're going to be looking at Anne Frank to begin with. I always like to start with how we're going to go through the uh, presentation. It's a teacher in me, it's what I do. Uh, we'll look at what it meant for Anne Frank as a refugee. And then we're going to look at what New Zealand was like in the years up to and during World War II. Um, a lot of New Zealanders, from what I, when I talk about this time, they always are shocked at some of the things that they hear about what New Zealand law was like. And we'll see how that uh, works with the Christchurch Refugees Emergency Committee. I'd like to say a special thank you to Dr. Oliver Sutherland, um, who his research on his father, Ivan Sutherland, uh, as well as the other members of the CREC, uh, helped put this presentation together and their work in helping German and Austrian Jewish refugees to New Zealand. And then lastly, how that all looks at modern day refugees and New Zealand's place in the world when it comes to modern refugees. When it comes to Anne Frank, her death and her life, they're inspirations for millions. I remember being 12 years old the first time I read her diary and thinking what I would have done if I had been in her position. And pretty much coming to the same conclusion, I never would have been able to do what she did. I don't think I could survive two years being locked down, let alone everything else that she was dealing with. But the story about what she went through beforehand is so often overlooked when we read her diary. And that's what we're going to be looking at now. So for Anne Frank, Anne was born to Edith and Otto Frank on June 12, 1929. Uh, Otto was a, a native of Frankfurt am Main in Germany, <coughs> while Edith was from Berlin. Uh, many people always question why did they go to the Netherlands? Well, there was already a family connection to the Netherlands prior to the war, uh, World War II. Edith was actually Edith Hollander prior to being married to Otto Frank. And Hollander was the German word for Dutchman. Her family immigrated to the uh, Berlin area roughly around the mid-1800s uh, for economic reasons, but there was always that family connection to that area. And so from there, we know that they were going to flee the persecution. The persecution begins very early in Anne's life. She was only four years old when Hitler took power. And contrary to what most people know, it wasn't all leaving at once. Otto left first after he was forced to give up his company in Frankfurt sets up a new company in Amsterdam, uh, and then is quickly followed by Margot and Edith, Margot being Anne's sister. But Anne actually stays behind for a few months, living with her grandmother. She's the last to follow them in 1934 in February. Eventually, the grandmother will move there as well and live with them until she dies in early 1940. One of the things when we talk about refugees is that is a legal term. It has a meaning of you are stateless, you are fleeing persecution, you are having to flee for political or, or religious reasons. In 1940s and 1930s, it didn't have a meaning because it wasn't a legal term. 
And so when the uh, Frank family are living in the Netherlands, they are stripped of their German citizenship. One of the things most people don't know is that when you're stripped of your citizenship, it doesn't mean that you can't go back. That's only part of it. It also means you can't leave. You have to have a passport. We take that for granted so much today because we just assume passports are something that everybody has. But back in the 1930s and 40s, if you were made stateless and your passport's taken for you, from you, it means you can't leave. So for millions of Jews throughout the continental Europe, trying to leave was impossible. And it was done that way on purpose. The whole goal was annihilation. Well, if you can't leave, it makes it easier to do that. Refugee status from Anne, a lot of people don't know that for most of her life, she was a refugee. Until the day she died, she was a refugee. Anne never was given her status back as a German citizen. And never formally was given Dutch citizenship until much later, posthumously, when Otto was given citizenship. This idea of being a refugee is central to her story and when we understand what she's writing about, of a better world, of writing about being a better person and doing more for other people. And it also is integral to understanding the Jewish understanding of coming to New Zealand and what it meant being a refugee here in New Zealand. I put this together because a lot of people don't know the journey that they tried to take. So Anne, her family, in Germany in 1933, they flee. Everybody knows this part. They get to the Netherlands. But from here, the journey didn't stop. They tried for years to get other places. Otto Frank actually had quite a few high-powered connections in the United States. Um, you all are familiar with Levi Jeans? Levi Jeans? He was very well connected to the Levi family. Uh, because he had trained under that family in business. He came to the United States in the early 1900s, twice before World War I. He was hoping that that would help them get to America. But American uh, immigration laws at the time were less favorable, that's the nice way to put it, concerning those coming from uh, European lands. And so they were denied, all of them denied entry visas into the United States even with families like the Strauss family helping them, and the Rothschild family as well. Otto, though, was granted a visa to leave in 1941, right before Margot was given her papers to appear uh, to go to the Vestaport camp. It was when the, he was given this visa to go to Cuba, but none of the other family is, and Margot receives those papers, they decide to go and hide him. It's also when the story of the refugee gets lost, because once the story of our coming out and auto surviving and the book is published, all of this is forgotten. Because the idea of Anne Frank as a refugee, it's hard for us to think about refugees being someone who can't leave. We always think of refugees as people who flee. But especially today, we see that refugees, the status of what that means, it's evolved over time. I love this quote by Otto Frank because it encapsulates the idea of not just Anne, but of how we treat refugees and why we accept refugees into countries. We cannot change what happened anymore. The only thing we can do is to learn from the past and to realize what discrimination and persecution of innocent people means. I believe that it's everyone's right to fight prejudice. Almost every single Holocaust survivor you will ever talk to, they don't generally talk about hate, they don't talk about their disgust, they don't talk about their disgusted Germans. They always talk about the bystander. And that if the bystander is the one who stands up and says, no, I won't allow this to happen, it would have stopped or would have been less. There were millions of Germans that were not Nazis. But for fear, for silence, of just they didn't want to stand out, or for many myriad of reasons, they didn't say anything. And so Otto, Survivors like Anne, if she lives, people like Elie Wiesel, they all talk about you have to stand up for someone who isn't you. And that's something that we see when we talk about how New Zealand is involved in this. So what you're seeing here is a draft resolution, and I'll make it a little bigger for you, of the New Zealand response to the Avian Conference. The Avian Conference was held in 1938 and the Germans decided that all Jews in Germany and Austria had to go. They didn't care where, they had to leave. And so all of the world powers were brought together, America, Canada, France, UK, New Zealand, 
And they were said, how many are you going to take? They all said zero. They all expressed their condolences and their friendship to the Jewish people and their desire for a peaceful world, and they all took zero, officially. Only two countries to take refugees officially were the Dominican Republic, which took 10,000. The Dominican Republic is one of the poorest nations in the Western Hemisphere, and Shanghai took 50,000. Otherwise, Jews could not get anywhere. Um, and this draft resolution, it is indicative of that idea that in New Zealand, if you weren't British, you couldn't come. And it was very, very stark in how they decided what constituted British. So the New Zealand response is in three. The first is in its immigration laws. Uh, New Zealand had a series of immigration laws set up to limit the immigration of non-British Europeans to the North and South Island. They wanted to keep a cohesive society. One of the arguments against allowing Jewish immigration was that New Zealand doesn't have anti-Semitism. Since we don't have it, if we allow Jews in, we're bringing anti-Semitism in. The problem with that is that it just wasn't true. Okay? Uh, and I ask these questions. As a teacher, I like to have give and take. How many of you know how many Jewish Prime Ministers New Zealand has had? It's one. How many? One. One? Anybody else? Three. Three. <laughs> most people, if they know of any, they know of John Key, because he's the most recent. But the first uh, Jewish Prime Minister of New Zealand was Julius Vogel. Julius Vogel was from Great Britain. Uh, a practicing Jew, um, and when he became Prime Minister, there are cartoons and articles in the newspapers from that time frame excoriating him about being a Jew, and saying he was going to ruin the country, because he was going to basically rob it of everything that it had, which is a common anti-Semitic trope. The other one is uh, Francis Bell in the 1920s. While he was not a practicing Jew, he was from a Jewish family um, and of Jewish ancestry. And again, the same thing. Even though he wasn't a practicing Jew, the same anti-Semitic ideas were brought in. And those are the same ideas that were put into the law. We don't want this here, so we're not going to allow it to happen. But just like other countries, Jews were already here. Jews were here since colonialization began in the 1840s. Uh, in Wellington, where the Holocaust Center is based, we're at the Orthodox synagogue, Bethel. And Bethel has been in Wellington since 1843. So Jews have been here since the beginning of colonial times in New Zealand. Oftentimes when Jews would come here, they'd come here as traders and whalers in the beginning, and then eventually doctors and politicians. So we have a long history of Jewish integration. What made the law so specific in this time frame was that the Jews who came generally were from Great Britain, so they were seen as British. In the 1930s, Austrians and Germans even though there was high recognition in the New Zealand government of the German power, as we'll call it, being a good thing, they still didn't want German Jews to come to New Zealand. What that did is that led to, in 1931, a new immigration act that labeled especially Jews as being enemy aliens. And oftentimes when we see that, a lot of people are like, what do you mean? Because an enemy and an alien, those terms tend to go together. An alien is just a term to mean someone not from your country or from your area. It's still used today in a lot of countries' immigration laws. But by attaching the word enemy to it, it makes it so that if you do come here, you are going to be legally prosecuted. And it did happen. Jews that were able to make it to New Zealand would be classified on a scale of A to E. E was the best. E meant you were completely docile. They had no worries about you. A meant that you were going to be interned. And there were Jews that were interned in camps on Somes Island in the Wellington Bay with Germans and Italians. Not all the Germans and Italians were fascists. Some of them were. And so New Zealand put Jews fleeing fascism into a camp on an island with fascists. This idea that we link of New Zealand as this paragon of acceptance it had to take time to get to that. And even then, we're still working on it. In the 1930s, New Zealand was not accepting of any non-British immigrants. And that leads to millions who tried to come here not making it. 
what you see here, and I'll make it bigger for you, this is a draft given to the Jewish community of Wellington. They had pleaded with the German consul in Wellington to help Jews get out of Germany because they had heard about the attacks. This was in 1935. This draft um, given to the Jewish community was from the Oberstadt community in uh, Germany. And as you see, it says that everything's fine. Jews are being treated well. There's no problems. Even in 1935, we knew that wasn't true. The first concentration camp to open wasn't in 1939 or even in the 1940s. It was in 1933, Dachau. And in 1933, an estimated 70,000 people went through Dachau. This is all before killings and mass murder even began. The Jewish community in Wellington knew something's not right here. And so in Auckland, we see newspaper articles written by the chief rabbi. Um, the one on the right, this was written in 1938, right after the Kristallnacht in November 9th and 10th. Kristallnacht being Night of the Broken Glass. Over 200,000 books, for example, were burned because they were written by Jews, had Jewish concepts, or communist, or even capitalist. Jewish men, women, and children were beaten, synagogues were destroyed, businesses were destroyed, and this was reported around the world. The head rabbi of Auckland was hoping that by putting this into the newspaper, he could convince the government at the time of Michael Savage and Walter Nash to allow Jews to come in. But it didn't work. And so there was another article written, and you see here, Jewish refugees in into New Zealand. One of the ways that New Zealand limited immigration is in how they decided who was considered a valuable immigrant. Now most times today, if you talk to people who have gone through the immigration process, they'll tell you they have to prove all of their educational background. It took me months just to get my degree approved in New Zealand. But that was a bad thing back in the 1930s. The more educated you were, the less likely you were to get into New Zealand. Because the idea the government had was that an educated person would cause problems. They would question and they would say, well, that's not right. We don't want to do that. Uneducated or even children were the best because they could be molded into becoming the ideal British citizen. And we see that in how many uh, people were actually able to get into New Zealand. By 1941, the war is in full swing. This was uh, printed in the Wellington Evening Post um, from London that they already knew an estimated one million Jews had been killed. By 1941, New Zealand was not allowing anybody in. Those that had gotten in, that was it. Um, and we'll see that's going to be the story even at the end. Roughly, New Zealand lets in between 1933 and 1940, give or take, about 1,100 Jews. Of those 1,100 Jews, most of them would be labeled between a B and D class enemy alien. If you were a C or higher, you had to report to the police every two weeks, to every week, to if you were even an A, you were interned and you reported every day. Uh, Jews that did make it to New Zealand that were D through E class uh, tried to integrate into New Zealand life. Some of them had more success than others. All of them left family behind. And chain migration was something that they tried and it just wasn't allowed. Uh, through personal appeals as well as trying to convince the government to just accept more in general, never happened. After the war ends, even after we hear about what happens with the camps, the government's official response is a closed door. New Zealand does not allow Jewish immigration into its country and its borders, even after the war. Um, Australia, its closest neighbor, allows about 30,000 Holocaust survivors into their borders. It's the third largest in the world after Israel and the United States. From 1945 until about the 1960s, New Zealand will accept roughly 5,000 people from Europe. Most of them will not be Jews, they will be from actually Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, because they were considered to be the most British-like. Those that had family here, if they had survivors in Europe, 
if they sponsored them completely and fully, meaning you paid for their passage, you paid for their home, you paid for their food, healthcare, everything, may get a passageway into New Zealand. But even then, it wasn't a lot. But what was really bad was that the RSA, the Return Service Association, they actually tried to send all of the refugees that had made it to New Zealand back to Europe. They had passed a resolution nationally that said anybody of German, Italian, Hungarian, or of Austrian descent needed to go home because they were taking jobs from these returned servicemen. Well, most of those that had come here didn't have the jobs that they were taking from them. Which brings us to the CREC. So you have up here the two main founders, as I know them. On the left, you have uh, Professor Ivan Sutherland and Professor Karl Popper. Um, Ivan Sutherland was a native Kiwi, but Karl Popper was of Jewish descent from Austria. And then on the right, you have his wife Nancy and Karl's wife uh, Henny. Their relationship was fraught, but this was something that united them. Um, as we see here, as they're having this picnic together. Uh, and that unitedness is what helped them bring so many people to New Zealand and try to bring so many people to New Zealand. The other person that is one of the main contributors is Otto Frankel, another Austrian Jew who makes it to New Zealand and then eventually settles in Australia. Things that they were successful in um, is one, the founding of this organization. It was one of its kind um, in the world in the sense that in many of the English-speaking countries, there were individuals who would work to lobby governments to bring in Jewish refugees. But foundations like this were not something that were very common outside the Jewish community. And so the main founders were Ivan Sutherland, Karl Popper, Otto Frankel, um, thank you, Reggie Hughes, and Roy Milligan. They worked on lobbying the government to accept more German and Austrian refugees. They worked personally on writing campaigns and meeting with government ministers to bring in these refugees. They did also work with other New Zealand um, foundations. The New Zealand Society of Friends, or the Quakers, were one of the uh, big supporters. One of our Holocaust second generation um, that volunteers with us in uh, Wellington, her father was brought in and worked and lived with them for a while. And so it's a very personal story for her. We have the New Zealand Union of Students. Those of us that are teachers can tell you that oftentimes students get a really bad rap of not caring. And that is so far from the truth. Kids oftentimes care more than adults. And they oftentimes work harder than adults to deal with these kinds of issues. Uh, we have the Timaru Refugees Emergency Committee uh, that worked in tandem with the CREC and then the Dunedin Jewish Welfare Society. Um, actually, prior to the 1900s, Dunedin did have the largest Jewish community in New Zealand who came here during the gold rush time. The support for refugees, though, isn't just getting them here. That was only part of the story. Support for refugees had to continue throughout their entire time in New Zealand. Refugees had to have been guaranteed some form of compensation, whether it's through a work that they had or someone was paying for them while they were here. And so that support continued from the CREC even after they were able to get people here. Professor Sutherland actually met many times with Walter Nash, who at the time was the Minister of Customs, because under New Zealand's law in 1931, the Minister of Customs was the one who could decide uh, to let people in or not. And so he met with him and lobbied him many times to try to bring more and more people into New Zealand. It's written um, in uh, Dr. Sutherland's book that uh, one of the letters uh, Professor Sutherland wrote to one of the refugee applicants that nine out of ten people are denied. Uh, when we look at the total numbers of people that the CREC actually helped, they received about 150 applications, which is around 250 people, if you include a husband and a wife and some having children. About 35 of those applications were approved, so about 70 people were let in. Um, so the percentage was better than what Professor Sutherland said. It was about 24%. Um, and I know that he probably would have wanted it to be 100%. Um, but to me, that's still an amazing thing. 24% is better than nothing. 10% is better than nothing. Because it was somebody who was standing up and saying, this isn't right, we need to help these people. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at three examples of these families that they helped. 
the journey that many of these people took um, was mainly from Austria and Hungary. Um, we do have one family we're going to look at who their journey also took a little path through Italy, but the focus was on German and Austrian Jews uh, to get here. Many of them would have a stopover in England. Uh, it just was part of the package that when you come to New Zealand, you stop in what we call it the motherland uh, on your way, uh, and that's also important to one of the families that we're going to look at. When they got here, um, they're supported eventually by other NGOs, they're supported by other groups. Many of the uh, refugees that got here would write that the biggest supporters they had wasn't other white Europeans. It was the Maori, who understood the discrimination that they had gone through from other white people. And so they supported and uh, welcomed these people into their homes and into their communities. Our first family is the Badian family. Now the Badian family is Joseph and Salka Badian, um, who were from Vienna, Austria. Uh, Joseph was a, um, originally from Austria, while Salka was Polish, and that's very important to understand, because Salka would not lose her citizenship until later, while Joseph was made a refugee much earlier, uh, because of the Anschluss. Uh, Joseph would become a naturalized citizen in New Zealand in 1946. Becoming a naturalized citizen, though, meant that you'd become British. So you had adopted British customs, you had adopted the British way of speaking and writing, and it wasn't just becoming a citizen. Like today, where if I were to become a citizen, I'm a Kiwi, but I'm also still an American. When he became a citizen, he became British. And that was what he was supposed to remain. Uh, both of them are actually buried in Linwood Cemetery here in Christchurch. Um, I'll show you a picture of their headstone a little later on. Um, while their uh, son, who is probably the most famous of the family, um, ended up emigrating to America. Um, their son, Ernst, uh, was born originally in Austria. Um, but what makes them come to New Zealand is that on Kristallnacht, Joseph is arrested and sent to Dachau. And he is kept in Dachau for six weeks. Don't exactly know what lets him out. There's nothing that specifies why he was let out, because we know that many of the Jews that would have been arrested would not have been released. They would have been shifted to other camps, including Buchenwald, which was opened by that time. But Joseph is let out, and he's given six weeks and said, you got to go. And so it is through the CREC that they're able to get into New Zealand. Um, they had to leave Austria by February 1st. Um, and they arrive in Christchurch on March 28th in 1939. And that's what saves them. But they have left pretty much everything behind, including other family members and all of their life. Coming here was not easy because they're not just starting over from what they can bring with them, they're starting over from nothing. And so for Ernst, though, he actually does really well here. Ernst excels at Christchurch Boys High School. Um, it does very, very well. Uh, eventually goes to uh, Otago, not Otago, Canterbury University, um, and then on to Cambridge, and eventually Harvard, where he becomes a world-renowned professor in classics. Um, he kind of sets the gold standard for studying classics. Um, his focus was on ancient Greece and Alexander the Great. And that is Ertz there. Um, he lived to be 85 years old uh, in Quincy, Massachusetts. He only died in 2011. Um, at the time, his wife was still alive, um, and his two children um, are still alive. I have done research into that. They still live in the United States. Um, and he became a very, very staunch supporter of a strong democracy and being involved in that democracy. Our next family is the Binswanga family. Uh, they, like the Badians, are going to come from the Austrian-German area. Paul Binswanga was a very highly educated uh, young man, while his wife, Adi, uh, was well-educated but was actually known for her fitness. She was a fitness instructor. And that's actually going to help them when they get to New Zealand. Uh, the thing is, is that Paul was not actually Jewish, neither was Adi. Adi was Protestant by birth and by family. Paul was um, of Jewish descent, and under the Nuremberg Laws, which classified somebody as being Jewish even if they had one Jewish great-grandparent. So it didn't matter if you were a Catholic or a Protestant or even atheist, 
you had a Jewish great-grandparent, you were Jewish. So it took it from being a religion into being this idea of a race, which Jews are not a race. We come in all colors, all shapes, all forms, on every continent in the world. And so what it did for Paul is it meant that he could no longer teach. Uh, so he and his uh, wife, they actually are going to flee to Florence um, in 1933 and live there for five years. And they do very well there. They set up a home for orphans. They have a lot of international friends that come into their home. And uh, Paul teaches at the local university. But in 1938, with the agreement between Italy and Germany, Paul and Audi are given six weeks and said, you got to go. You can't stay. The thing is, is that Paul didn't have to come here. Paul's mother was an American. And they may have heard Americans, we love our amendments to our Constitution. Under the 14th Amendment, that made Paul automatically an American because his mother was an American. So he could have gone to America. But American immigration would not have allowed his wife. We did not allow chain migration at all. If you had married a foreigner, you had to stay where that foreigner was from. You could not come to America. If you tried to, you would be stopped. And almost all immigrants at that time frame were no longer coming in from Ellis Island. Ellis Island had pretty much been shut down by then. They were actually coming in through Galveston and in through uh, Florida and Baltimore. And the ports were very, very closely watched because America knew war was coming. So Paul could not get to America. So him and his wife make it to New Zealand in 1939 uh, with the help of the CREC. They're classified as Class B enemy aliens. That meant that Paul could not work pretty much. Paul used to be a professor of German and of Italian. Uh, coming to New Zealand because of that, um, that classification meant he could not teach German unless he was given special permission by the government to teach soldiers that were going to be going to Europe, uh, German. Um, he would be allowed to teach um, uh, Italian as well as Latin, if memory serves me correct. So most of their survival is down to Adi, who was allowed to work as a fitness instructor. Um, Adi was very European, uh, the classic middle class European woman of the time, uh, hosting parties, and she wore the fur coat she would often see at the time. For her, coming to New Zealand was very, very difficult because everything relied on her so much. Adi eventually publishes a book at the end of the war um, called, And How Do You Like This Country? Stories of New Zealand. It did very well, um, and it's actually had its, uh, a reprint um, as 2017. Um, you can get it on Amazon if you want. And it's not just her stories of being an immigrant to New Zealand, it's other immigrants that were there um, around them at the time, as well as Maori at the time. Um, the thing about uh, her publishing is that one of the reviews in a newspaper even after the war, you can see the anti-immigrant beliefs in the native white New Zealander and how they describe her writing. Her writing was quaint and perfectly adequate English. I spoke five languages. She didn't speak perfectly adequate English. She probably spoke almost perfect English, as most people who speak multiple languages do. But even in 1945, she wasn't accepted. Integration for them, it was very hard, and the Binswangers just eventually they couldn't do it. They would achieve naturalization in 1946, um, but they leave in 1948 to go back to Italy, uh, where they live the rest of their lives. Um, Paul will die um, about uh, 13 years later, while uh, Adi lives on for quite a while, and their children just describe how she was always that quintessential European woman of the 1930s. This pa uh, painting is actually in New Zealand. It's at the Dow's Museum in Lower Hutt in the Wellington region. Um, it's titled The Immigrant. It's painted by a New Zealand painter, uh, Douglas McDermott. Except for the title was not given by Douglas. The title was supposed to be called Audi. Um, the title was given later on by a museum. Um, and that again shows the anti-immigrant view because for Douglas, he's painting a friend. Audie and him, they were very well connected. They were connected through the Frankels, uh, the background um, that you see. I'm not sure if the, yeah. This is actually Otto Frankel's lounge. And it's all to describe, again, that very proud European woman. Um, but when you read the description, everyone always talks about her stance and how haughty it is. But for Douglas, that's not a woman who's haughty. That's a woman who's broken. That's a woman who misses home. 
and who's trying to make it in an area that just doesn't want her. These are naturalization papers from that time frame in 1946. So you can see here, here's Joseph Bodian's naturalization and Paul Binzanga. He's labeled as a teacher, which he wasn't technically. He wasn't allowed to be, even in 1946. His classification as an enemy alien was never taken away. In fact, Ivan would try to get his classification changed from B to C or D, and the government said no and threatened to change it to an A. Um, while Badian um, worked at a brewery, and the brewery is here in Christchurch, if I'm not mistaken. That will be a question for Dr. Sullivan a little later. Um, their wives, their naturalization papers were done a few months later. Salga and Adi. Notice there's no any kind of job or profession for them. So they just didn't care. This is the headstone of Joseph and Savka. She actually went by Sally. Um, they died one week apart in 1965. Um, I'd like to think it's a great love story that someone, she couldn't live without him, and so she went with him. Um, I don't know, but it, I think it's a great way to remember them. Um, Ernst, um, apparently, when he was buried, um, had wanted to move them to America so that he was buried with them, uh, but it's way too cost prohibitive. Um, and under Jewish uh, law, you can't move bodies like that, so they'll forever remain in Lindwood ceremony. That's cemetery. Our last family is the Kaiser family. And the Kaiser family really highlights how helping refugees can be a gamble. Um, because when you are helping people who are halfway across the world, you don't know what's going to happen. Paul, we think he was born in 1907. What we do know is that Paul was a tailor. We know that Paul was in his 30s when he applied with the CREC. Um, we know that he was married. Um, I think his wife's name was Sally. Uh, Sarah, excuse me. We're not sure. Uh, we think his mother-in-law, um, we know she was sick at the time. Her name was Mario. Um, we think that she would have been born around this time, but what we don't know is what happened to them. Basically, this time frame, um, family immigration was supported by the CREC for all three of them. They never make it to New Zealand. The last communication the CREC has with them is in 1940, uh, was saying that they had landed in England. At the time, though, Paul and Mario were both sick, and immigration laws in that time were very strict that if you were ill, Nine times out of ten, you were sent back to your country of origin. Upon searching Yad Vashem's website, Yad Vashem is the World Holocaust uh, Memorial uh, and Education Center in Israel, we found an entry for Paul Kaiser, who was a tailor from Vienna, who was deported to Opoke, which is near Lublin, which meant he probably would have been killed in either Belchik or Maidanik. Uh, but again, we don't know. Um, we've searched British records, we cannot find a Paul Kaiser as being naturalized or anything. Uh, but it highlights how helping refugees can be part of an issue or you don't know if it's actually going to work. Which brings us to the idea of refugees today. Um, I like this quote because it's something I think a lot of people don't understand. Is that the idea of the past means the past is done, it's over, and it doesn't affect us anymore. That's just not real. The past is never really the past because it still affects us. The refugee crisis of 75 years ago still affects us in their descendants today. It still affects us in how we react to refugees today. Uh, once the war ends, there were roughly around 7 to 11 million people that were made refugees uh, in Europe. Uh, this is not just Jews, this is all nationalities in Europe that had been moved around for whatever reason, whether it was because they voluntarily did or because they were <coughs> part of the war machine. Those 7 to 11 million people had to find a way to get home. In 1948, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this outlines what it means to be a person in the world today and the rights that you have that can never be taken away from you. And one of those is the idea that you can never be made stateless. You can only have your citizenship taken away if you have another citizenship. But if you only have one citizenship, you can never be made stateless. It's against international law.
The first refugee convention is passed in 1951, but it's very, very narrow. The refugee convention passed was really meant to mean European and white. Uh, refugees from Africa and Asia and South America were not yet formally recognized as being legal refugees. Uh, it's not until 1967 that that's changed. Um, we're at the height of the Vietnam War, uh, war in Southeast Asia and Cambodia and Laos, so it's been changed to now include non-white Europeans as well as those of other parts of the world. But for a lot of this time, New Zealand's really not involved. Uh, it's not until the 1980s and 1987 that the first refugee quota is a law is passed. Um, and 800 refugees a year would be allowed in. Uh, and that law really wasn't changed very often. Um, it, the last time it was changed was actually in July of this year, and it increased it to 1,500 refugees. So it's still not a lot of people that are allowed in. Uh, the largest refugee crisis we have right now is the European refugee crisis. It officially ended in 2019, but COVID has changed that. Um, 2019 was only eight months ago, or 10 months ago. So did it really end, or are we just seeing that no one has the ability to deal with it because they're focusing on COVID? And we're talking millions of people that have come into European borders. In New Zealand, between the years of 45 and 87, uh, New Zealand remains a relatively closed nation. There is no formal official refugee policy. They will allow refugees in sometimes, um, including the four to 5,000 refugees that I talked about earlier that came mainly from Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. They also allowed Hungarian refugees to come in at the end of the 1950s. Um, and in the 1970s, they'll allow uh, a lot of Southeast Asian refugees to come in, fleeing the Vietnam and Cambodian War. But most of them don't stay, because the community here, is, uh, it was too spread out, and it wasn't unified. And so we see a lot of them leave again to go to places like Australia, Canada, and the United States. From 1987 to today, refugees in New Zealand mainly come from the areas of Africa, the Middle East, and South America. Um, in the 1970s, starting with the Chileans, is when New Zealand begins to change its policy on refugees. Um, but even then, the Chileans really don't stay. They come until the fall of Pinochet, and then they go home. It wasn't until the African and the Middle Eastern refugees that we see them staying and making roots and starting new communities. Again, initially that number is only 800 a year, and it's a very, very small number. Argument is that New Zealand is a very small country. We accept too many refugees, they don't overload the system. One of the things that is about being a refugee is that you have two types of refugees. You have the refugee that goes to a camp, meets with a UN representative, and says, I'm fleeing for my life. And then you have asylum seekers. We're really not talking about asylum seekers um, because that's a special case. Um, asylum seekers are outside the quota system. All nations that are part of the UN are required by international law, if an asylum seeker lands on your soil and requests asylum, you must investigate the case. If they go to a UN camp, you can turn them away, investigation or not. But if they make it to your soil, you can't do that. An example is the United States. We have done this for decades since the fall of Cuba. If a, a Cuban makes it to Florida, they automatically are given asylum. If they're caught in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Caribbean, they're sent back to Cuba. Occasionally, New Zealand does do compassionate uh, reunions of families. Um, and New Zealand actually did lead the way in this idea because New Zealand was the first country uh, in 1959 and 1960 to allow disabled and ill refugees into the country on that compassionate grounds. Uh, and so, for that, that's a great thing. Um, but compassionate grounds, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And it can be, and is quite often, denied. The reason we don't deal with asylum seekers here very often is geographic location. Uh, we're two very islands at the very bottom of the world, as most people say. Um, it's very hard to get here if you're on a boat. Uh, if you're flying on a plane, it's very easy to stop you at an airport, because most people who are asylum seekers flee with nothing which means they can't afford the plane ride either. Um, so if they do show up at an airport trying to get here, they'll be turned away at the gate. Um, but again, we're not really talking about asylum seekers. Uh, 
we're talking about those that would come through the United Nations when it comes to modern day refugees. So what does that mean for New Zealand today? It means that the activism that started long ago with the CREC and with other organizations that work to get Jewish refugees to New Zealand, it's still here. We still see that activism today and people working to help other areas of the world affected by conflict, whether it's the Syrian conflict, whether it's in Africa, um, helping them to get to a safe place. We see that resettlement's not always going to be an issue though. We can't resettle everybody. If it's an economic refugee, how do we help them where they're from? What are the root causes of why they're trying to leave? Because if we try to resettle every refugee in the world, it'd be chaos. And also the country that they're coming from would collapse even further. So how do we help them where they are? Future issues is also going to be that definition of refugee. We often look at refugees as being political or religious refugees, somebody fleeing violence due to ethnicity or uh, discrimination. But more and more commonly, we're seeing economic refugees. Many of the refugees going into Europe today are those types of refugees. They want a better life for them and their families. Because wherever they came from, the economy just isn't supporting them. So how do we define a refugee? How do we continue to define a refugee? And should we change the definition of refugee? These are issues that we have to deal with, not just in New Zealand, but as the world as a whole. Because if we're talking about an economic refugee, and we say we need to deal with the root causes, how do we help them fix their economy? And do we say there's a time when we can't do anything and we just let them come in? And that last looks at settlement. Understanding the history of New Zealand, understanding colonization, is looking at understanding refugees. People that came to New Zealand from the British Isles, coming here thinking it would be a better life for them, whether they were of Irish descent, Jewish descent, whether they were Protestant or Catholic, trying to flee the intertribal warfare of the continent at the time. It's part of the story of New Zealand. You can't, we can't ignore that anymore. And so if we want to make New Zealand a better place, not just for the people that come here as refugees, but for all of us, we have to confront that history. And we have to understand how that history shapes us and shapes our understanding. These are our resources, and again, one of our biggest resources, and I want to say thank you again to Dr. Oliver Sutherland for providing us with a lot of his research. Um, thank you guys very much for coming and for listening. Um, I hope it was enlightening for you, um, and I would encourage you to ask questions. I'm going to invite Dr. Sutherland to come up. Um, if you have questions about the CREC, I'll let him answer them because he is the expert on that. Um, if you have questions about Anne Frank or the Holocaust, I'm more than happy to uh, answer those questions. Center for putting together this presentation. Um, Chris knows that I, I researched the story of the Christchurch Committee um, when I was writing a biography of my father, but it doesn't get very wide publicity and it deserves a greater place in New Zealand history. And it's it's thanks, to, so. thanks to the Holocaust Center, um, they've, they've uh, compiled this presentation which really honors that work that my father and, and several of the other Christchurch citizens did in the, 19, in the late 1930s, over 18 years ago. There is just one thing while I'm on my feet. Um, I, there was one other story that I'd like to tell, a family that, that Chris knows about, but we couldn't include in the talk, and that was Peter Hilferding. Peter Hilferding, his father was Rudolf Hilferding, and he was the finance minister of the, of the Third Reich of the Weimar Republic. And, and of course, when Hitler came to power, he, he escaped to France, and, and in the end, was either killed or killed himself. He uh, was probably killed by the Gestapo. But his son Peter was a bookseller, uh, and, and uh, Peter eventually, he, being a Jew, he was not allowed to 
sell to run a bookshop and was told to cut it, that he must, uh, get, he must give that up and achieve, try and get out of the country. So he does make contact with the Christchurch Committee through the, the Quakers, really, with the main link through to Europe for the committee. And the, Reggie Hughes was the Quaker who, who led the uh, Christchurch contingent uh, on this committee. And so Peter Elfitting gets here. And uh, my mother told the story because she became very fond of him. And he became very fond of my father. He got a job with Whitcomb and, to Whitcomb and Toombs because Whitcomb and Toombs had friends like my father and others in the, in the uh, uh, academic community and they provided work for, a new, for many uh, of the Jewish refugees. So Peter came, he got a job with Whitcomb and Toombs, but his name was Hilferdin. And the one thing he wanted to do was not to work for Whitcomb and Toombs, but it was to kill Germans. And he wanted to kill Germans or do his bit to kill Germans and to kill the Nazis in particular. And so he wanted to join the New Zealand Army and he joined the New Zealand Expeditionary Force but not before he changed his name. And the reason for telling the story is it's a nice one about my parents and just their relationship. He came to dinner at our place. We lived up on Hackthorn Road at the time. And around the dining room table, he was talking about uh, his, his wish to um, serve in the New Zealand Armed Forces. And Hilferding was not a very New Zealand name. So they got out a map of New Zealand, and what my father did, and they were looking around the map of New Zealand, Milford Sound, and he became Peter Milford. And from that time on, he became Peter Milford, he was Peter Milford, he served in the expeditionary forces, he, he, was, a, he was in the intelligence because of course he was so fluent in German, and he assisted in the, in the uh, later stages of the Second World War. And um, the nice thing is I've been in touch with his son, his son lives in Vienna. In Vienna. And we, we've talked about this relationship between our fathers, and, uh, and they corresponded quite a lot during the war, so I thought I'd tell you that because it's a nice story, and I know Chris knows the story, but he didn't have time to fit it into his talk. So, so anyway, greetings to you all, and thanks once again. Um, the Christchurch Committee did do, they worked incredibly hard. Um, the relationship between my father and Nash was interesting. My father, and my father and Papa, um, I'll sit down in a minute, but um, the, the, <laughs> the relationship with, well, let's talk about Papa first, because this was, my father became Professor of Philosophy at Canterbury in 37. And that chair was vacant, and there were two main applicants, and one was my father, and one was Karl Popper. And my father was a graduate of Glasgow University, but essentially a Kiwi. And Karl Popper, of course, was already had a huge reputation as a philosopher at that stage, and was, was in Cambridge. And the, no doubt thought that he would get the chair in Christchurch straight away, but he didn't. My father did. And Popper was a junior lecturer, and if he knew anything about um, the Poppers, or indeed the Frankers, and they were very close friends of our family, they were pretty arrogant. Otto Frankl and, and, and Karl Popper, they were brilliant. They were brilliant uh, uh, graduates of the University of Vienna. But they were, uh, in New Zealand, you know, we were all bloody non-entities. And my father was a complete non-entity uh, as far as Karl Popper was concerned. And so their relationship was not that, was not that great. But the relationship certainly between uh, some of the refugees, the other refugees that came, my father and the Christchurch Committee really were. So thanks, I'll sit down now. I would answer any questions, but you know, we, we, we might run out of time. But um, anyway, uh, it's nice to be able to share these stories with, with, uh, with your family and friends. Yeah. Yeah. opportunities to, to say that the Christchurch Committee had, a, had a over, it was, it, there was an executive which my father chaired with Otto Frankel and, and Karl Popper and Reggie Hughes and that group. But there was an overarching general committee who interacted with the gov with, with, with government, or local government particularly, and raised funds and so on. And it was chaired by the, um, by the rector of the university at the time, Dr. Height. And there were three or four professors who were, the, the university at Canterbury was very involved. And so when my father just was, was, was perhaps became a bit of a figurehead, but in fact, 
it was some of his professorial colleagues were very supportive. All of the letters that my father wrote were on headed notepaper from from Canterbury University. So without, with, and with no problem at all with the sort of activist role they, they had. Similarly, Otto Frankel worked for DSIR. He was brought out here as a um, as a plant breeder from the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge in 1929. He wasn't a refugee, but Otto had a very stellar career in New Zealand and then went off to CSIRO. But all, he was the honorary secretary of the Christchurch Committee, and all of his letters were written on DSIR, you know, crop, crop research division or whatever it was. So they, they had the support, I guess, is what I'm, it's a long-winded answer to your question. But they did have they did have tremendous support, and the university was a, was very supportive of the, uh, the plight of the, of the Jewish people. So it wasn't just my father, but he just happened to chair the committee. If I may add to that, to what how you make somebody not a bystander, uh, it comes down to responsibility. Um, oftentimes, if you talk to somebody, like if they see something, and you say, "Why didn't you get involved?" The response is is she was there, he was there, he was there, they could have done it. It's not my responsibility. Um, and when we allow that mentality to happen, uh, is when we allow people to, as we say in America, pass the buck. Uh, and it, it comes with education. Teaching kids and adults that you can't pass the buck. That you are responsible, not just for yourself, but for those around you. I mean, we heard it time and time again. We are a team of five million during lockdown, right? Because we're not just responsible for ourselves, we're responsible for stopping the spread to everybody. It's that same idea of making sure that you have that responsibility for the community as well as yourself. If there are no questions, I would like to invite Dr. Sutherland up to present to him some gifts from the Holocaust Center, uh, because this would not have been possible without him uh, and his research. Uh, many of our current second generation uh, volunteers would not be here without his father's work. Um, and so um, we have here um, one of the seminal books on refugees in New Zealand by Dr. Ian Beaglehole. Um, that's for you. Just recently in 2018, correct me if I'm wrong, please, um, we translated the Diary of Anne Frank into Te Reo Māori is the 73rd language um, uh, the book has been translated into, and the first uh, Polynesian language that it's been translated into. Um, and knowing that your father worked very closely with the Māori community, um, this tanga to you and to your family. Um, and then um, we have a traveling exhibition going around New Zealand that was just here in Christchurch at the library at Turanga, um, that was the uh, Children's Holocaust Memorial that honors of the 1.5 million children that were killed in the Holocaust um, with buttons. And just as each child was uh, an individual, so was each button that was collected in the individual. Um, and this is uh, a book written by our patron, uh, Dame Joy Cowley. Okay, sorry, we don't use those terms in America, so I'm always not sure if I'm saying it. Um, and it's the story of how this um, uh, exhibition, thank you, uh, came to be and what it means. Uh, so thank you very much for everything. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to your family. Have a good evening. Everyone, just um, on behalf of the Air Force Museum, on behalf of Murray and Louisa up the back here, um, our staff members and the director of the museum, a huge thank you for coming tonight, but a, a very special thank you to Chris for coming down from Wellington. Um, personally, I, I found that incredibly interesting, and I've already got a couple of bits I'm going to add in for St. Margaret's College on Friday when we take them through the exhibition. Uh, These are some things that I didn't know. Um, please be aware the uh, exhibition upstairs, the Anne Frank exhibition, is open until the end of the month and we're open from 10 to 4 every day and admission to our museum is free so please um, I hope you can come back and have a look at it if you haven't already. Um, but thank you for coming along tonight, thank you, thanks again to Chris and Lizzie and to the rest of the team as well. Cheers. Thank you.